the uncomfortable truth for people seeking to lead big change, either big because it's big scale, big because it's ambitious, or big because it crosses boundaries and is therefore complex, is that you're probably going to fail. Um, worldwide, the research suggests about 70% of complex large-scale change efforts fail to reach their target. Only about 5% achieve what's hoped for them. So we're saying we want to get some pretty big change done at scale in a way that crosses multiple aspects of the NHS system. This is a big change we're talking about. In order to try and move us from the, the, the misery and despondency of the stats into a more, a more likely position for success, a lot of work's been done over the past few years in NHS to understand and test out how we can get change occurring at large scale in a complex, adaptive environment. And it turns out that, again and again, the research evidence and the experience of successful change leaders and programmes highlights eight aspects which you've got to bring to bear. And each of these is listed here in the NHS change model. As you look at the components that are on there, some will be ones which you personally and instinctively like. They're ones which resonate with your skill set or your experience, your expertise, perhaps your role. Um, some of them are ones that you may think are possibly even evil and certainly not your cup of tea. Um, we all have blind spots. I think the NHS as a whole has a number of blind spots. We're going to look at each of the components because here's the thing about the evidence. It shows that if you really want to stand a good chance of achieving success at scale, making something happen like this, then you need everything on your side. Um, you need every single component you can lay your hands on. And the second one, even more challengingly, is they work best when they're lined up. They work best when they're mutually reinforcing one another. So let's look at what they are. The first one, uh, really at the heart of it, for good reason, is our shared purpose. Um, and the question here is really, we're talking about making a change. Does this change meet a purpose which is clear and which is shared and which connects with our values? When people hear what it is you're trying to achieve, will they see the value of it? Will it meet the values that got them into this kind of work? Will they feel motivated to commit to it? One of the big challenges about leading complex change is that doing it through a plan and then compliance usually fails. You can't have a plan and beat up the people who don't comply with it and think you're going to get there. People have to buy in, people have to commit to change of this nature for it to be really successful. So here are some questions for us today. And this is a question which we're going to ask every table to think about because it runs like a sort of thread, golden thread through everything else. Are we clear on the purpose? Do we have a clear understanding of how health coaching can add value? Have all relevant stakeholders contributed to shaping our purpose? How will we ensure that the shared purpose is communicated continually, consistently? And are we framing the narrative for each audience? Can you think of ways in which what you've heard today would not connect with some people who need to see the value of this? We need, to, we need to name that. We need to be specific and do something about it. So having our shared purpose and doing something about it at the heart of what we're going to be doing, really vital. Let's move to the next component. Engagement to mobilise. You may have come across a lot of the social movement approaches to big change and getting people on board with large, complex change that the NHS has started adopting in recent years. Really acknowledging the fact that, again, simply telling people what to do doesn't work if you're trying to do big things across boundaries. They need to feel empowered. They need to be mobilised to take action for themselves. So engagement is not about, we've got a plan because we're clever or we're in positions of power. Let's transmit it to you. Engagement is about collaborating on understanding what to do and then handing over the power the responsibility. So some of the questions for us, and we're going to ask particularly one of the tables who has engagement to mobilise to deal with this. I think it is that table over there, that board there, marvellous, just by Caroline. The questions are, who do we need to mobilise? What is the clear narrative which will mobilise for action? Can all of us leave this room and in two minutes describe what it is and why people should commit to it? 
Um, how will we lead through commitment as well as compliance? How could the NHS, which traditionally does things through compliance in a remote, top-down way, how could the NHS get health coaching used differently? <coughs> Specifically, what are we asking other people to do? And what existing assets can we build on? I'm glad we've raised assets already. We're not starting from nowhere. What can we build on as well as add to? So particular questions there for people whose table are going to be asking about engagement to mobilise. Next one is about leadership for change. We've heard quite a bit about the role of leaders in making this stuff happen. So um, let's look at some specific questions for the, the table who are going to be asking these questions. Does everyone who needs to lead think of themselves as a leader? We're thinking about embedding health coaching for everyone across the NHS who needs it. Do all our leaders have the skills to lead transformational change? Do they have clear permission to lead? Are we seeking to lead through commitment as well as compliance? Are we distributing leadership, sharing it? Are we developing the next generation of people who are going to make this happen? So we think questions about longevity and sustainability of uh, what hopefully we are at the start of a movement today. How are we going to lead this movement? Spread of innovation. This is really crucial, isn't it, at the heart of what we're talking about today. Um, it's one of the things I would suggest the NHS does as, as badly and embarrassingly badly as most healthcare systems. In the US, they've actually measured it and showed that most really promising technological innovation takes between 15 and 20 years to become commonplace. Um, it's embarrassing. It's wrong. We're probably the same. Um, here are some questions about the innovative aspect of the use of health coaching, which we might consider now. Get on the table, get on your sheet for action. How can the culture encourage and reinforce the spread of this? How will we help the right people get the right skills? How should we evidence effectiveness of this innovation? And what infrastructure will be needed to create spread? And I think also sustain the use of this innovative way of practicing. So some questions. For specifically for the table who are going to have spread of innovation as their particular focus. Improvement methodology. Um, the use of improvement science has become commonplace in a handful of small little patches of the NHS. Um, so there are some hospitals who've made great strides in improving quality or productivity through using lean. Um, there are some people like the Dementia Alliance who've really got some amazing progress on antipsychotics using a social movement methodology. What's the methodology that's going to help? And we're particularly going to be asking at all levels of the system. So I think it's right that what we've talked about here are some challenges at the level of policy, um, at the level of the movement, us in the room, local systems, the microsystems. What, for me as a GP, what would have to be different about our practice to make this work? How can we improve those systems? And the very sort of most granular level, that of the actual interaction between professional and person. What's the case for quality? What learning theories will help people develop the knowledge they need? How should we plan the strategy at each level? And how could we use continuous improvement to sustain success? Really common finding across the NHS is that when new things are tried and prove promising, they're not guaranteed to be sustained. Um, partly because of the way in which they're implemented. It's such hard work making change that it's not sustained. And a lot of improvement methodologies help with those challenges. Let's move on to a couple which I think many of us in the room probably would not list among as amongst our favourites. Rigorous delivery, project management, programme control, key performance indicators. Um, it's great having a burning ambition. It's essential to have a shared, pur shared purpose and a clear goal we're not always very good at achieving them, partly because we don't go through the rigorous process of turning a dream into a reality. So we need today to capture what exactly we're seeking to achieve, how we will know when we get there, how far we off are we off from the goal in central Manchester or in Somerset. Do we have an effective approach for delivery of change? monitoring progress towards this. Somebody in the movement's going to have to own this. Someone's going to have to make it practical and real. How will we quality assure some of the stuff we've been talking about? Great ideas need some backup from the world of rigorous delivery. So one table's going to be looking at that. 
Another thing we're really quite poor at is the use of measurement to help promote and sustain improvement, particularly measurement that's used transparently in a way that could engage, motivate, even excite people. Are there things we could start measuring that would start getting people asking new questions about health coaching? Are there things we could start measuring about our own practice that could get others saying, that looks good, really quickly, you know, within a month? What could you measure? How could you? So have we articulated our goals as measures? Have we selected measures that would stimulate curiosity and drive improvement and demonstrate progress? And how will we measure, analyse and disseminate effectively? We need some answers to that today for the table who've got that sheet, please. And lastly, lots of us have touched on this today, um, the system itself is a big determinant of the environment in which people work the likelihood of success. Um, and the key word here is alignment, very often. So there are incentives for doing the right things, but there are also incentives for doing other things. Um, there may be a bit of an incentive in one direction, but a very big incentive in another direction. There may be some aspects of the infrastructure and the environment which are missing, completely missing, that only the system can put in place. So how can we create an environment in which this is attractive, meaningful, natural, what changes are needed? We've talked a lot about that today. How can we incentivize this? And how can we manage potential unintended consequences? Particularly, you know, what happens when you incentivize one thing is we often squeeze the balloon and we move problems elsewhere. So how can we get this all lined up is the question which one of the tables are going to be particularly helping us to answer today. And so, by the end of this session, we're going to have some answers in every single one of those. 